So is nobody going to talk about the fact that Pokemon Sword and Shield were probably the most mismanaged main series Nintendo games released in the last three years? See, in most big companies, software projects are led by the managers, not the developers. The managers decide the timeline, how to prioritize tasks, and which developer or team works on which features based on guidelines given to them by their superiors or their clients. In general, unless they're extremely talented or are heavily involved in the product design, developers have very little say in what they're going to be working on or even how long it's expected to take. You might be able to blame developers for a piece of software being dysfunctional, but if it's unfinished, you start by figuring out what management did wrong. And Sword and Shield are very clearly unfinished. Even more than that, it's obvious that whoever estimated how long it would take to complete the game severely undershot the mark. In fact, it looks like the development team only got halfway through the expected timeline by the release date based on how the game turned out. We can also actually pretty easily estimate the timeline they had for features, and at which point they realized they were out of time. It looks like the game was built more or less starting with the story and cities, which were likely designed in story order, and the development of the wild area came afterwards. It also looks like management only realized how far behind they were after the sixth badge city, because that's when the quality of the game falls off dramatically. Start with the overworld. Up until Surchester, which is the city that has the 6th gym badge, the cities and environments are all beautifully designed and unique. Your home village is built on rolling hills with these unique houses for you and your rival. Motostoke is a sprawling industrial city with lots of nooks and crannies. Holbury has a quaint sea town feeling to it. Stow Inside has an interesting western town feel. And Bolognia is obviously the crown jewel in terms of the atmosphere in this game. Even Surchester, which is mostly just a wall of buildings, has its own unique vibe. Each of these towns feels lively and distinct, but there's a pretty steep drop-off in quality after this. While there are only two towns after this point, they're both pretty bland. Spike Muth is a straight line with basically nothing in it, and its only defining characteristic is that it's dark. And Winden is just kind of a generic town with nothing of note in it aside from this fountain. It's a substantial drop-off from the impressive bar the other towns set, which is strange considering that you would think that things would get more impressive towards the climax of the game, not less. The same can be said of the routes and areas outside of towns that you explore. In the early parts of your adventure, you go through quaint farms, mysterious ruins, a very atmospheric fairy forest, and my personal favorite, a really lively mine filled with Pokemon that comes closest out of anything in this game to fulfilling Pokemon's promise of adventure and exploration. But, like with towns, the last few routes are sorely lacking in anything that makes them feel unique. You have this water route that's reminiscent of the Hoenn Pokemon games that came out 15 years ago, and this icy mountain gets outshone in detail and atmosphere by a similar route from a Pokemon game that came out over 20 years ago. And while these features are pretty conspicuous already, the truly damning evidence is in the story. While the first half of the game takes its time in building up the conflict and lore of the world, the second half very abruptly resolves it and throws it away. Anyone who's played the game at this point knows that the story's climax doesn't come anywhere near what you would expect from any game, especially a Pokemon game. In all of the other games, the climax begins with some huge event, which is usually a terrorist attack from the main villains of the game, like taking over a radio station or blowing up a lake. By this point in the game, your character has already proven to be one of the strongest trainers in the world, so you're tasked with helping stop the villains. You chase them to their headquarters, where you fight through a maze of enemies to reach the boss, who you battle and beat, but who then goes off to summon a powerful and dangerous legendary Pokemon despite your best efforts. You then have to fight through another, more difficult maze and battle the boss again to reach the legendary Pokemon, who you then confront and catch in order to stop it from destroying the world. I know it sounds a little silly even by video game standards, but it typically does a good job of combining the story and the world to create a satisfying conclusion to the Poke lore storyline. However, in Sword and Shield, you can tell right away that the story isn't going to have a satisfying conclusion. The climax is triggered in this case by a secretary running up to you to tell you that the chairman of the local energy company is evil because he's chatting with your friend's brother. Which, although weird, doesn't really count as a disaster event on the same scale as blowing up a lake. After that, you chase a guy around in a circle to take his keys, take an elevator to an empty floor, and battle the secretary from before. You do confront the chairman, but he just tells you to go do something else, which you do. There's also a weird cutscene in the middle of all of this, where some guy mimes a rock concert that lets your character take the subway to the chairman's tower instead of having to walk there. And that's the entirety of phase one of the climax, with a grand total of zero interesting mazes to solve or cool things to discover. Phase two picks up a bit later, when the chairman hijacks the TV screen of his own stadium to tell everyone he summoned a big bad legendary, a scene you don't even get to see by the way. Like before, you find out the chairman is back in a different tower, so you go there and take another elevator to another empty room, where this time you fight the chairman. 
You beat him, and then you take another elevator to a final empty room where the legendary is just sort of hanging out with your friend's brother. You battle it and beat it, which makes it very angry. So angry that it transforms into a big hand. And then the Pokemon from the box art show up to help you fight the hand. And you beat it together and save the world. The end. That's the climax. This climax was the main reason I started to think the game wasn't finished. Because it wasn't really necessary. There's another climax in the game where you become the world champion, and that would have been a perfectly acceptable conclusion to the game if we just had that. But it seems like the higher ups at Game Freak just needed to have all of these boxes ticked to be able to say that they made a feature complete Pokemon game. You have the bad guy team, you have the big boss you see throughout the game, you have two towers that look like they were planned to be dungeons, and you have the big legendary being summoned that you need to catch. But they don't actually do anything with any of these features, and the climax is basically just empty. You don't even have to compare this to other games to realize this wasn't finished because earlier parts in the same game spent a ton of time and energy on the lore, and these characters in the different settings related to the climax. The story, much like everything else I pointed out, actually falls off just after the sixth badge, which I think shows pretty definitively that the game just did not get the development time it needed. So there's two elephants in the room that I still haven't addressed, which I think really drive home my theory about the game's timeline and the game being unfinished. Both of which also I think are very closely related. The first big elephant is the wild area, which was a big open area that was heavily involved in the game's marketing, where you could run around freely and catch all kinds of Pokemon. Remember how I was saying that the overworld areas started to decline as you reached the end of the game? Well, the wild area is the biggest defender of that. It's totally bland and empty. It basically consists of a few rocks and trees scattered throughout a big empty field, all of which use models straight out of 3D games that came out in the 90s. It's low quality even compared to other areas in the same game! Which makes me think that the development started with the story areas in story order, and the development of the wild area only started really late into the overall process. The fact that an expansion came out 8 months after the original games, which consisted of nothing but a second giant wild area, with way more detail than the original, backs that theory up. It seems like the developers just didn't have the time to make the wild area what they actually wanted to make. And this leads me to my second elephant. The main purpose of the wild area was to have a place where you could have Pokemon roaming around freely in the overworld, something that has never been done in a main series game before. But because they had so little time to work on the wild area, it stands to reason they also didn't have time to work on any of the models for the Pokemon themselves that would be wandering around the wild area. They had so little time that their only option seemed to be to reuse models from previous games, which at this point has been pretty much definitively proven to be the case. I imagine that as a part of this, they also realized that they couldn't bring over all 1,000 Pokemon from past games, since they couldn't even have time to properly recreate 400 Pokemon for this game. All of this is to say, when you take everything together, Game Freak's management is very clearly the source of the problems here. Developers got the time they needed to make the first half of the game right, but barely enough time to finish the second half. And the reason I'm focusing on this so much is because if the developers were bad, you can just hire new ones. But when the management is bad, it means there's something fundamentally wrong with the culture of management in the company. So I don't know exactly what the problems here are, but when you get an unfinished product like this from the flagship product of a big software company, it's always one of three things. The simplest reason could be good old-fashioned managerial incompetence. It's possible that the managers at Game Freak don't have a good sense of either how long it takes to make their games, or how much progress their teams have made so far. They may have just not paid close attention to where they were in the timeline of the game's development versus where they should be. So they let things slip so far behind that it wasn't recoverable. As a part of this, the developers could have also lied about what they were capable of or what they'd gotten done, but the reason you hire a manager is because you want someone to make sure that the work is getting done properly, so if that was the case, it's still on the managers. This could have been the reason Pokemon Sword and Shield weren't finished properly, but given the other possibilities, I think this wasn't a bigger factor than it normally is in any other game. The second reason could be that higher-ups, like the president or head designer of the games or even the board of the company, weren't willing to accept that they had misjudged what was possible to do in the time frame they were given. This kind of behavior always leads to one of two outcomes. Either managers feel pressured to lie about their team's progress because they don't want to be punished for falling behind unrealistic expectations that their bosses think are realistic, or teams are forced to continue work on their original plan with the hopes that if they keep working towards it, it will somehow come together. In both cases, the product stays way behind in its timeline until a higher-up realizes what's happening and finally changes the development plan. Given the fact that the game spends so much time building up to the climax and the wild area, and the fact that both of those aspects look completely rushed together at the last minute but were put in anyway, I imagine the higher-ups had a very specific vision for the games that they weren't willing to compromise on. The third reason could be poor prioritization by the organization as a whole. 
In Pokemon's case, I think the games had a strict release date that had to be met, no matter what the quality of the game was, because everything else in the Pokemon franchise depends on the existence of a new game. The Pokemon franchise is the biggest franchise in the world, but despite the fact that it began as a video game series, most of the money the Pokemon company makes is from things that sprang out of the games themselves. 80% of the revenue the franchise makes comes from merchandising, the TV show, comic books, and trading cards. Each individual main series game accounts for less than a quarter of the total revenue the Pokemon company earned in the years the games came out, and less than a fifth of the earnings the company makes throughout the lifetime of the game until the next main series game comes out. In other words, the games being publicly available matters way more than the quality or content of the games themselves, so it would make sense the Game Freak's priority was to release a new game, not a good one. And again, I don't know what the exact combination of problems was with Sword and Shield, but whatever it is, it means there's something fundamentally wrong with the game development process at Game Freak or the Pokemon Company. And unfortunately for us, I don't really see those problems changing. In most companies, you don't just overhaul your management structure or fire high-level decision makers unless something is catastrophically wrong. And as far as the board of directors at the Pokemon Company is concerned, not only is there nothing wrong, but these games were a huge success! The main metric they would use to define the success of a game is how much money it makes. Sword and Shield are not only the third best-selling Pokemon games of all time, they're also the third highest-selling Nintendo Switch games of all time. And as far as the rest of the franchise is concerned, there's plenty of new content to work with, and they can make new merchandise and TV shows for a few years based on this game alone. On top of all of that, the success of this game sends a strong signal to Game Freak that consumers absolutely don't care about the quality or content of Pokemon games. The main takeaway for Game Freak is that they can cut content even further back in future games and nobody would complain, as long as there are new characters and new Pokemon with new gimmicks on a new console. Less ambitious games also means it will be easier to meet deadlines, giving even less reason to make any meaningful changes in the game development side of the company. As a result, I think from now on we're going to get games that are even worse than Pokemon Sword and Shield, not better. Before I end the video, for the people who watch this and think that this means the Pokemon franchise is finally going to die, keep in mind that people have been saying that exact sentence for the last 15 years. Pokemon is likely to outlive us all, pumping out new Pokemon every few years until the world ends. For as much as you or I don't like these new games, kids and nostalgic adults always will, so there will always be room for more Pokemon regardless of how good the games are.